Welcome to the Anscombe Society's first public event of the semester, Gay Marriage, a Debate. I'm Ben Coons, co-president of the Anscombe Society, a student organization founded in 2005 for the purpose of defending marriage, family, and sexual integrity on Princeton's campus. Since then, more than two dozen similar groups have formed at other universities across the US and now even in Mexico. The society holds weekly discussion meetings, hosts dinner seminars with professors, and organizes public events like this one tonight. We hope through the intellectual development of our members and civil discourse with our peers to deepen Princeton's understanding of these vital social issues and affect change for the common good. So that we can continue to improve our event and understand their impact, please fill out the surveys you should have found in your seats and turn them in either uh, at the booth on the right or to uh, one of my peers on the left with boxes. Um, we'll be selling copies of Sharif's book, What is Marriage After the Debate, and any Princeton student who turns in a survey can buy the book for only $5, which is a 50% uh, discount. Thank you to the audience for coming out tonight. I'm pleased to see such a great turnout. Um, before we begin the de debate, I would like to read the university's free speech policy. It's Princeton University's policy to uphold free speech and the free exchange of ideas, including the expression of peaceful dissent with speakers who have been invited to campus. However, the university asks audience members to curb expressions of their views so that all may hear the speaker's remarks. Audience members who create a sustained disruption of this event may be removed from the venue as such behavior violates university policy. We believe spirited discourse is integral to the mission of a university, and we've invited our speakers to take questions at the conclusion of their remarks. Now I'd like to thank our co-sponsors for their generous support. Thank you to the program in Gender and Sexuality Studies, the Office of Religious Life, Christian Union, USG Projects Board, Leadership Institute, Alliance Defending Freedom, and the Love and Fidelity Network who will be having their annual conference this weekend. I'd also like to thank our debaters this evening for agreeing to participate in this event and all the work they put into it. Uh, it's a great privilege to have you both here tonight. Finally, I'd like to thank and introduce our moderator for this debate, Eric Gregory. Uh, he is a professor of religion at, the, at Princeton. He is the author of Politics and the Order of Love, an Augustinian Ethic of Democratic Citizenship and various articles related to his interest in ethics, theology, political theory, law and religion, and the role of religion in public life. In 2007, he received Princeton's President's Award for Distinguished Teaching and is known for his popular course, Christian Ethics. He is a Rhodes Scholar who earned his MPhil in Theology at Oxford and his PhD in Religious Studies from Yale. He serves on a number of executive committees at Princeton, including the Center for Human Values, the Interdisciplinary Doctoral Program in the Humanities, and the University Public Lectures Committee. Please welcome Professor Greg. Well, friends, let me add my welcome and gratitude to our many sponsors for this event. Can everyone hear? Is this too loud or is it fine in the back row? Okay, um, my happy task as moderator is to keep us on time and to help facilitate the conversation. Before introducing our speakers and format for this evening, I might mention, though I probably don't have to tell you, that many debates about our topic, even in the name of civility, can become a source of confusion, scapegoating, bigotry, and mean-spiritedness, sorts of things Princeton works hard to avoid. Universities, at their best, aspire to be a space of free inquiry, disciplined by the virtuous giving of reasons, vulnerable to disagreement about everything from the most technical aspects in your major to issues of public concern and different visions of the common good. It is good for places like Princeton to provide forums like this one, especially in ways that raise fundamental questions about law, morality, and political community at a level beyond what we too often find in our public discourse today. Some may deny that a debate on our topic is still relevant or warranted. And I'll say I particularly appreciate the recent posters where I was renamed Elric, the son of Gregor, or Kyle, for those of you who saw them. But let me suggest that our resolution, as stated, implicates all of us in ongoing discussions, including sometimes fierce internal disputes within many diverse communities including the LBGT community and various religious communities, among others, regardless of views about homosexuality. So at this point, it's worth highlighting our resolution itself, which appears behind me, because it is meant to raise 
perhaps more focused, more interesting, and more complicated questions than you might anticipate. So our resolution is resolved. The case for same-sex marriage has a rational limiting principle, and changing marriage law accordingly would strengthen the institution of marriage. Now, I will leave it to our speakers to frame their approach to the resolution, but note it includes two parts, which asks our speakers to express commitments about marital, marital monogamy, and helps us as a group, perhaps, at least achieve disagreement, something that's very hard to do, about the nature of marriage as an institution, the appropriate role of the state in regulating marriage, or even recognizing certain relationships and not others. So the resolution aims to solicit responses based on the relevant work of our two distinguished speakers, perhaps to identify common ground about the purposes and goods of marriage that may put them both at odds with other views. Even as I suspect and I know, we will also find many differences between them. Professor Stephen Macedo is the Lawrence S. Rockefeller Professor of Politics and the University Center for Human Values. He writes and teaches on political theory, ethics, public policy, and law, especially on democ democracy and citizenship, diversity and civic education, religion and politics, and the family and sexuality. His current research and forthcoming book is called, quote, Just Married, Same-Sex Couples, Monogamy, and the Future of Marriage, to be published by Princeton this spring. In that book, he defends same-sex marriage, marriage as a civil institution in law, and monogamy between two people of any gender from the standpoints of justice and the common good. Sharif Gurgis, from the great class of 2008, majored in philosophy at Princeton, graduating Phi Beta Kappa and Summa Cum Laude. His senior thesis on sexual ethics won prizes from, for the best thesis in ethics and the best thesis in philosophy. He also won the National Dante Prize. After Princeton, he earned a BPhil in moral, political, and legal philosophy as a Rhodes Scholar at the University of Oxford, and he is now pursuing a PhD in philosophy at Princeton and a JD at Yale Law School. In addition to numerous articles in academic and popular venues, in 2012, he co-published with Ryan Anderson and Robert George, What is Marriage? Man and Woman, a Defense, which defends conjugal marriage of one man and one woman. So our format is each speaker will offer remarks for about 20 minutes or so, followed by five minutes of response, and then five minutes of further interaction between them, and then we're gonna open the floor for 40 minutes of question and answers, perhaps ending with some brief closing remarks. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Macedo. Well, thank you. Uh, this is a much grander uh, setting than I had anticipated. Uh, only last night did I realize it was here, and uh, it's always daunting to see your colleagues uh, in the audience <laughs> along with students. I'm used to making a fool of myself in front of students, but uh, uh, this will be um, uh, <laughs> a new experience. No, not entirely, I'm afraid. Uh, in any case, uh, you know, as Eric said, there obviously are uh, live issues before us. For one thing, from both the left and the right, uh, among many academics and intellectuals who look at marriage and look at same-sex marriage, you get a, a similar kind of uh, argument with respect to same-sex marriage. And, and so what you have on the left and the right are, are people who argue from both sides that same-sex marriage is an unstable stopping point on the path to more radical reform. I mean, on the right, for decades now, uh, Intellectuals, activists, scholars have argued that same-sex marriage puts us on a slippery slope to, you name it, polygamy, incest, bestiality, uh, and all sorts of other things. The list goes on and on. Dandruff, uh, you name it. Um, but on, on, the, on the left as well, uh, there are many scholars who argue that especially if you're a political liberal or you believe in a, a principle of state ethical neutrality, uh, if you're committed to the state being fair, uh, to the range of conceptions of the good life that exist in our society, then, then, then marriage as such is unfairly, a way of unfairly favoring in law a particular kind of relationship uh, that not everyone uh, honors and esteems. So there are many scholars on the left, uh, in fact, uh, who argue that yes, we should be moving in the direction of polygamy, uh, a newer form of polygamy, not patriarchal polygamy, but a more egalitarian form of polygamy gets hypothesized by these scholars. 
and there have even been some uh, who have argued that incest, uh, if it's among adults and they're not planning to have children and so on, it's purely consensual, but that too ought to be something that we re-examine the strictures on, uh, and other uh, arrangement as well. So the, the question of whether, uh, uh, how same-sex marriage relates to the institution of marriage and the institution of monogamy, and whether more radical uh, uh, changes are in the offing, is in fact a very live question uh, among uh, scholars, ethicists, uh, intellectuals, and so on. So I want to ask three questions uh, in these very brief remarks. Uh, in order to get at the, uh, the, the question that's been posed for us. Uh, a variation on Sharif's question in his co-authored book, what is civil marriage? Uh, why same-sex marriage and why monogamy? I'll, I'll just focus on monogamy as the limiting uh, theme here. Uh, and uh, we can talk about other issues uh, if you wish. Now, why civil marriage? Uh, marriage is obviously both a sacrament uh, or a religious ceremony with different meanings depending on the religious community, and a civil institution that helps define the entitlements and opportunities of citizens, the members of our political community. That political community is organized under a constitution that bars religious establishments, guarantees religious freedom, demands respect for individuals' equal basic liberties, and prohibits invidious forms of discrimination that can't be publicly justified with good reasons and evidence. Now, it seems to me that Sharif's book has done, actually, I think, a good job of defining uh, marriage as it's understood within the Catholic tradition uh, and as a, I would say, a, a, perfect, a certain kind of perfectionist sexual ethic, but I don't think it does a good job at all of defining marriage as it exists, or defending marriage as it exists now in the United States. And one of the points I want to make is that marriage as it exists now in the United States is very well suited to same-sex couples. In fact, there's an article from 1996 by David Chambers, a law professor at Michigan that I'll draw on a bit here, who makes the case very strongly that the incidents, the legal incidents of marriage, the dimensions of marriage in law as they existed in the United States back in 1996 were extremely well suited to same-sex couples, and in fact, in some ways, were better suited to same-sex couples than heterosexual couples, uh, for a reason I'll mention. But in any case, let's. Think about what marriage amounts to in the United States now. There are two broad dimensions to it. The one that gets focused on in the public debates typically is the symbolic dimension, the expressive dimension, what marriage means, what it means to enjoy the status of marriage in our society. And I think that's very important because it has great resonance in our society, more resonance than in many European countries where uh, same-sex uh, couples and uh, gay and lesbian uh, uh, movements have been less enthusiastic about marriage, and, and they've seen it less as an important marker of civil equality, but it matters here. But there's also, and obviously extremely important, all the legal dimensions of marriage, the legal incidents of marriage, as they're called. There are 1,100 federal laws that touch on these incidents in one place or another, and marriage uh, rights and obligations are mainly defined by state law, with some variation across the states. So these are hugely important. Let me just say a couple of words about these uh, first. I mean, there are three broad purposes that they serve. They acknowledge these legal incidents of marriage, uh, couples' affective and emotional bonds, you know, to put it that way, their closeness. The laws of marriage recognize and support the very close relation that spouses have and facilitate that close relation through things like immigration and naturalization privileges, the right to visit your spouse if they happen to be in prison, things like that. Also, of course, recognizing the closeness of spouses as surrogate decision makers, being able to act as next of kin. Uh, now, it's often said that these incidents of marriage are benefits, as if they're kind of rewards for being married, things that the government does to reward people for being married. But actually, they're, they're a balance of rights and responsibilities. There are special obligations and responsibilities that married couples bear to one another. You can't simply disinherit your spouse. You can't throw your spouse out of the homestead without a good uh, reason. Uh, when the marriage breaks up, judges will be involved making sure that the division of marital property uh, is equitable. So, and, and of course, married couples uh, file jointly in federal tax returns, and that uh, exacts a marriage penalty when uh, married couples uh, both have reasonably good income. The reason is a fairness reason, the idea being that married couples can live more cheaply by 
pooling their resources and living together than they could by living singly, so it's thought to be fair, but it imposes a special burden rather than a reward uh, out of fairness towards uh, singles, at least one way to look at it. Secondly, uh, these, all these incidents facilitate parenting uh, relationship that, that, that uh, married uh, couples typically enter into. Uh, and uh, finally, of course, they recognize spouses' uh, economic interdependence on one another. And the reason why these incidents suit same-sex couples extremely well, and these are the utterly important features of what it means to be married, the reason why they suit same-sex couples extremely well is because of the major place that major change that took place in marital relations in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, where the differentiated roles of husband and wife and the dependence of wives on their husbands was rooted out of the law, where husbands and wives became equal uh, uh, under marriage, where the rights and, and responsibilities of husbands and wives became equal. And marriage was no longer as essentially a relation of a husband and wife in gender role differentiated roles. Uh, it's because of that, and that's really the great revolution associated with marriage and family life in, this, in, in the United States and more broadly in the last 50 or 60 years, the gender revolution, women's equality, that's a revolutionary change. Same-sex marriage fits very comfortably into that institution of marriage in which men and women spouses are equals and are free and often encouraged to earn a living and share equally in home responsibilities. So marriage as it exists in this country, so far as those legal incidents are concerned, is very well suited to same-sex couples. And as I said, in 1996, David Chambers argued that it may be even better suited to same-sex couples because same-sex couples are less likely to have a kind of marriage-induced dependence and vulnerability that could make one of the spouses the wife if she uh, loses her capacity to support herself economically that could make one of the spouses vulnerable through marriage, which is something that feminists have been concerned about, Susan Oaken, for example. So in any case, these incidents make marriage very well suited to same-sex couples. Uh, and however, there's also the second dimension, the uh, symbolic dimension. That's also extremely well suited to same-sex couples. Uh, and as I said, that's been at the center of the debate about marriage, really a symbolic dimension, for the simple reason that in California, in Vermont, in Massachusetts, and in some of the other states where same-sex marriage early became an issue, same-sex couples had available to them domestic partnerships or civil unions that had, in state law at least, all of the same legal incidents and benefits, not in federal law but in state law, that marriage had available to them. So at a certain point in the litigation in California, over Proposition 8, which defined marriage as necessarily a relation between one man and one woman, which is the way Sharif would have it, uh, a judge said to uh, Charles Cooper, who was the attorney uh, defending Proposition 8, uh, you mean this whole debate is about the word marriage? It's about that label, marriage, and, and what it stands for. And Cooper said, yes, uh, the word is the institution. Cooper said. And that question's come up in other venues as well. It came up in New Jersey when the issue was being uh, debated here in the courts, and it came up in the Supreme Court, I believe, as well. It captures an important truth. The institution of marriage in the United States is freighted with social meaning and significance. The word and the relationship it denotes in our culture, the public recognition that access to marriage entails, are crucial parts of what's at stake. I'll quote Kristen Perry, the lead plaintiff in the challenge to California's Proposition 8, marriage, she said, would provide access to the public moral language to describe her relationship with her partner. And I quote, I'm a 45-year-old woman. I've been in love with a woman for 10 years, and I don't have a word to tell anybody about that. Marriage would be a way to tell our friends, our family, our society, our community, our parents, and each other that this is a lifetime commitment. We're not girlfriends, we're not partners, we're married. Marriage involves, here and now, the public declaration and social recognition of a mutual commitment of a distinctively extensive sort. Let's say this, marriage in America is, a generally, is generally understood as an exclusive and long-term commitment aspiring to permanence between two people who love one another, share a household and sexual intimacy, and who promise to love and care for one another through all of life's trials. 
sickness and health till death do us part. Hopefully. Spouses are expected to care for one another and be there in time of need. For most younger couples, children are expected to be very central. Having and raising children together is profoundly meaningful. And children provide one important reason for keeping a marriage healthy and stable. The well-being of children is one good reason for the state to take an interest in marriage. But for some younger couples and many older couples, raising children together is not what their marriage is centrally about. As the Massachusetts Supreme Court put it in extending marriage rights to same-sex couples, and I quote, the exclusive and permanent commitment of the marriage partners to one another, not the begetting of children, is the sine qua non of civil marriage. And many same-sex couples share with heterosexual couples the wish to be married in the eyes of society. They want access to the public status of being married. They want to signal and help secure their mutual commitment, take on marital responsibilities, and enjoy marital benefits. They can benefit from marriage, and they do benefit from marriage in the same way as straight couples. If marriage has a reasonably well understood public meaning, we can ask, what's added to that by the law of marriage? Well, the existence of the legal form of marriage facilitates the fulfillment of people's desire to get married and to be understood to be married as a matter of common public knowledge in their society. That is in the eyes of the whole society, not just in the eyes of one's church or one's social circle or one's group. Marriage is very public, and the law of marriage helps make that public common meaning legible in our society as a whole. When people know you're married, all sorts of presumptions follow. If you say, that's my spouse, that's my husband or my wife, everybody says, oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> they know what it means, roughly speaking. Uh, and all sorts of things follow from it. Hospital visitation rights, decision making, joint control of property, and so on and so forth. No other relationship, have ha no other relationship has the same social meaning. Domestic partnership, civil union, other options have unclear social meanings. And that could be exacerbated if we introduce a great deal of variety, though there are reasons for introducing some variety, uh, 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 which we could talk about later, if that's what, uh, if that's, uh, what we've decided through deliberation. The social meaning of marriage permits a great deal of latitude. People's marriages, their living and work arrangements, their attitudes towards children, sex, money, etc., differ in many ways, not surprisingly, in a diverse society like the United States. There's nevertheless common patterns, aspirations, and expectations. Now, part of what marriage generates are social expectations. Spouses are supposed to treat each other in certain ways. They're supposed to look after each other. They're supposed to practice fidelity to one another. They're supposed to treat each other affectionately. And those social norms, those social expectations create, well, let's put it this way, they help to strengthen the spouse's commitment to enter into a well-understood public relationship surrounded by certain social expectations strengthens your capacity to live up to those expectations. So in a way, to enter into a marriage is to constrain yourself, to limit your options, to make certain actions more costly than they would otherwise be. But because people want to enter into these constraints, because they see them as enhancing their freedom to commit to a certain kind of relationship, the constraints are freedom enabling as long as people enter it freely. All right. so. I'm running out of time, so I'd better move on. That's marriage, and in a way, I've made the case, I think, as well for same-sex marriage by setting out the case the way that I have. As I say, many same-sex couples, including the various litigants and the cases uh, that we've seen in California and Vermont and Wisconsin and elsewhere, they want to enter into the marital relationship. They want to enter into the marital relationship on the terms that I've described. They want to make a public commitment to one another. And they want that commitment to be recognized by their government in the same way for them as it is for others. And evidence suggests that gay and lesbians, gays and lesbians typically benefit in the same ways as others, physically, psychologically, uh, through the deepening of their commitment. The health benefits, the stability that comes with a publicly recognized commitment. And of course, the 200,000 plus children being raised by same-sex couples benefit as well. A consideration that's weighed very heavily with Justice Anthony Kennedy and for good reasons. We owe it to same-sex couples and their children to accord their relationships, as Kennedy puts it, equal status and dignity under law. The suicide rate among gay teens is double that for others. The inevitable childhood and adolescent challenges of teasing and bullying are often made immeasurably worse 
uh, if a child is suspected of being gay or lesbian, and that's bound to be enhanced if the child's parents are not allowed to marry. There is a, there is a stigma against uh, gay people in much of this country, uh, and uh, the exclusion of gays from marriage puts the government uh, uh, behind that stigma in a way that should be ended. Richard Posner, Judge Richard Posner in the Wisconsin case added that there are 400,000 children living in foster care in this country. Very many of them could benefit if their adoption to same-sex couples was, by same-sex couples was facilitated by the extension of marriage rights. So the Supreme Court's frequently emphasized marriage as a fundamental liberty. Uh, I won't quote those cases. There's a very good case for that. And without quite saying in any of the marriage cases that gays should be subject to any kind of heightened scrutiny with respect to their exclusion from marriage. Kennedy has quite properly, the Supreme Court majority has quite properly insisted that if gays are gonna be excluded from marriage, there at least need to be substantial reasons and some evidence for excluding them. Never quite said what the level of scrutiny is, doesn't really make any difference, but some good reasons, some evidence. And over and over and over now, for 20 years, a different versions of an argument has been brought out as to why it makes sense, why it's important for the public good, why it helps to support marriage to exclude gays from marriage. And one by one by one, they've all kind of fallen aside. I'm running out of time, so I won't go through them. Uh, the latest argument that's become prominent is called the channeling function of marriage. And I think, you know, there's something to this channeling function of marriage. It was the basis on which I think the court in Louisiana, the only uh, federal court that has uh, upheld the exclusion of same-sex couples from marriage since uh, the Windsor case, uh, this is the one of the sort of 18 or 19 uh, cases in which same-sex marriage rights were not uh, uh, required by a federal court. It was on this basis that the um, judge there uh, uh, upheld the def definition of marriage as involving one man and one woman. It came up as well in Wisconsin and Indiana a couple of months ago when Richard Posner was one of the judges. And his, the oral argument in that case is well worth listening to. It's on the web. And his opinion is terrific, uh, in my opinion. Uh, he asks, well, you know, what are the reasons for excluding same-sex couples from marriage? What public interest is advanced? How does it help to protect marriage? to exclude uh, same-sex couples. Tradition, the um, attorney said, the assistant attorney general, I think it was, tradition. Well, Jeff Posner says, tradition, wait a minute now. Tradition, that people would have said that in support of Loving versus Virginia, which uh, excluded, uh, which, which said marriage was restricted uh, on the basis of race, that, uh, that if one person was white, you couldn't have a marriage to a person of another race. So tradition can be good or bad, just citing tradition if what you mean by is a history of practice is not a reason. What's, what's your reason? What's, he said, what's the common sense reason? What's common sense evidence? His boy voice got higher and higher pitched. Eventually, the attorney did come to this channeling argument, uh, which, which is the argument that, and I, I'll paraphrase somewhat, this is how Posner paraphrased it. Well, heterosexuals, by having sex, can, if they're not careful, accidentally have babies. And therefore, the state has an interest in channeling heterosexual sex into marriage, because marriage is a good place in which to raise babies. And that interest is not there with respect to gay couples. OK, so immediately Posner comes back and says, OK, well, first of all, that seems, is there any, do you have any, any evidence or any reason to think, since there are many gay couples raising children, that uh, we need, who still would want to have a reason for excluding them from marriage, since they are many of them are raising children. Do you have any evidence that excluding uh, gay couples from marriage would uh, assist the channeling function, or that somehow including gays from marriage undermines the channeling function? No, said the attorney. I don't have any evidence, and I, I can't think of any reason. But but people seem to think there's a reason. Do you, well, do you think that's an important reason? And, and the attorney said yes. He said, well, if there's no evidence for it, are you aware of any studies that are underway to determine whether the channeling function is undermined by same-sex marriage? No, I'm not. Is the state conducting any studies to determine whether the channeling function is undermined? But no, I don't think so. So Posner then caricatures this argument in his opinion by saying, and I quote, this is more or less a quote, I didn't go back to it, heterosexuals get drunk, have sex and accidentally have babies, therefore they can marry. Homosexuals can't accidentally and irresponsibly give birth via their sexual acts, therefore they can't marry. 
And he says, go figure. Um, uh, in any case, we can talk about it. There is the position that Chief Shreef represents is the one sort of serious philosophical argument, it's the one serious ethical argument for excluding uh, same-sex couples from marriage, well, for defending marriage in a very particular way. It doesn't just exclude same-sex couples from marriage, it just defines marriage in a very particular way. I'm gonna let him lay that out, uh, and then we can talk about it. Uh, the position has been criticized quite a lot uh, in the media of various kinds, including in the popular media, and Slate Online and the National Review and various other places. I sympathize with those criticisms because I just don't understand uh, how this understanding uh, uh, helps us make sense of marriage as it exists in our country now, and I don't understand why it provides a basis for excluding same-sex couples from marriage. Uh, but since I'm running out of time, I'm gonna let him explain that and then we can talk about it. Um, one thing this position does, and maybe it's the only thing I'll say about it, is it makes, because the position wants to include sterile heterosexuals, the elderly, and so on, in marriage, which is fine. I mean, of course, they should be included in marriage. It makes not children, but the act that is apt to produce children the centerpiece of marriage. It's what consummates a marriage is intercourse or coitus. And this seems to be to misplace the public concern with marriage. I'm just gonna say this about the position and uh, without explaining it particularly. But it seems to me that children provide a reason for being concerned about the stability and health of marriage, for wanting marriage. Children benefit from families that are stable. They benefit from two-parent families. It's true, so children do better with two parents. Some of it's resources and so on, but in general, it's the best place in which to raise children, so there's a legitimate interest in that. But it isn't, it isn't the act that produces children that calls for permanence to this and um, exclusivity. And that's the part of the argument that I don't understand. I have some quotations and so on, but I won't burden you with them. This argument has not been aired in any court cases lately from what I can see. Uh, and I don't think it has a grip beyond a rather narrow group of, uh, this is my contentious uh, characterization, but beyond a rather narrow group of, 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 of uh, philosophers and some others who uh, accept certain premises that are vastly, widely rejected in our society, um, including the use of contraceptives, which, uh, which uh, precludes marriage from being consummated, I think, in the way that, that this argument sees marriage being consummated. But I have to skip that over. I'm just going to add with one very brief word with respect to Tunis. Uh, the, the, the resolution is phrased in such a way that we look for a limiting principle as if there's like a, a which we think should be a principle of marriage that also explains why it's two. I'm not sure that that's the kind of thing we need. I think what we need is to examine how marriage works as a social institution, defined by law in certain ways to serve a wide variety of social purposes. How does marriage, as designed in a certain way by law, suit the good of individuals, their interests in ways that we can understand and their good, and likewise, serve the good of society in a whole variety of ways. And it's at that level that we can discover problems with plural marriage. Some of them are intrinsic and inherent because overwhelmingly plural marriage, as it's been known as polygyny, one husband with multiple wives, there are reasons having to do with evolutionary psychology and sort of obvious behavioral differences between men and women to think that that's not entirely accidental and the court in British Columbia that upheld their criminal prohibition on polygamy, which summarizes uh, quite a body of evidence concerning polygamy as a lived social form, makes it clear that polygamy as a lived social form is inherently more prone to conflict, jealousy, violence in the home, lower investment in future generations of children. It's also more productive of conflict in society. The reason being that complex families in which a husband and multiple wives, but even if it were multiple husbands and multiple wives, were living together in very complicated, in effect, parent and step-parent relations with half relations and so on and so forth, those kinds of families are generally far more prone to conflict, jealousy, and so on. And all of the evidence that I'm aware of, virtually all of it, suggests that indeed plural marriage uh, is productive of much higher rates of violence, conflict, and so on. 
Now, in particular religious traditions, these things can be controlled by the inculcation of virtues of equal treatment and so on. But that, from what I can see and from what the court in British Columbia saw, those, those virtues, while important, uh, tend to check what look like inherent tendencies of a complex uh, social form. And just let me add this. What same-sex marriage does uh, and what monogamy does is help to secure for everyone in our society a fair opportunity for the great good of falling in love with and settling down with one person who you love. Uh, if there were to be plural marriage, again, all the evidence suggests overwhelmingly that it would tend to be the rich who would be able to take advantage of that with multiple spouses. Uh, that's how it's always tended to be. Uh, and uh, that exacerbates inequalities. It denies people, the way you can put it, this the fair opportunity to pursue the great good of family life. So monogamy tends to go along with democratic equality uh, to a much greater extent uh, than, uh, than polygamy. Now, you'll notice, by the way, and Charles Krauthammer noted this 15 years ago, none of the societies in which women have become equal and there's gay marriage and so on, is there any great movement towards polygamy? In fact, it's the other way around. Polygamy is hyper-patriarchal. Uh, it goes along, it's hyper-traditional. It's in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, it predates monogamy. Uh, so if there's a slippery slope, it's away from polygamy. And same-sex marriage nudges us on a slippery slope towards gender equality in marriage, towards equality generally in marriage, and towards democratic justice with respect to everyone having the opportunity to pursue the great good of family life. And polygamy as it, in a lived social form is at the other end of the spectrum, uh, as I say, hyper-traditional, hyper-patriarchal, and uh, hyper-hierarchical. So I'll just leave it at that. Well, thank you, Steve. Thank you, uh, Eric, for agreeing to moderate this and everybody for coming. Um, I should let you know that Steve, Professor Macedo, and I have talked about this several times, mostly in the context of his class, and I'm very grateful um, to him for all of those interactions. I think I've always learned something from them, uh, and I think given the focus of today's talk, actually there's good hope, good reason to hope, that we will all learn something, because it's not just the general debate pro or con on same-sex marriage. It's more specific, and I think it illuminates the landscape, what the philosophers would call the, the logical space, the, the options that we have on this issue. I should also mention that Professor Macedo is the person you should blame if you don't like what I've contributed on marriage. I was in his class, I guess in 2006 or something, as an undergrad here. It was the first ethics or policy-related class I had taken, ethics and public policy, co-taught with Philip Pettit, who's also here. And uh, Professor Macedo had the topic, had the lecture on same-sex marriage, and he was presenting Robbie George's argument, and he was doing his very best to give you the most sympathetic take on that argument. And I remember sitting kind of at the top of the room in, um, in the Friends Center and thinking to myself, there's something there, but it needs development. And the rest is history. <laughs> He created a monster in that moment. Let me begin by telling you what I'm not gonna argue for, because when I speak on this issue, people typically hear what they expect me to say uh, because of the public discourse on it more generally. I'm not gonna talk to you about a pure argument from tradition, because it's always been this way, it always should be. That's obviously fallacious. I'm not gonna talk to you about a religious argument. I'm gonna give you a view of marriage and certain kinds of arguments that can be traced back to Greek and Roman thinkers who had no connection to Judaism or Christianity. So even if you think this is just, on my part, some kind of veiled, thinly veiled Catholic theology, there's still a tradition there to deal with. I'm not gonna talk about the moral status of anybody's sex life uh, or about what's unnatural. I reject the argument that uh, you have to use organs for natural purposes or anything like that. We're also not talking about what to ban. People can live uh, as they choose in these issues. And despite the limiting principle language of the resolution, we're not talking about certain kinds of slippery slopes. Not, the Santorum argument that this leads to you getting married to your chocolate lab is not at issue here. Uh, I think there's a clear argument from principle against that that Professor Macedo is fully entitled to, which says that consent is integral to marriage. Uh, as a friend of mine recently said, 
For a dog, woof does not mean yes. And so that's ruled out. And it's not, again, just about same-sex marriage. It's about two things. One thing I want to convince you of is that Professor Macedo's argument, his very best argument, articulated in the best way for recognizing same-sex relationships as marriages, proves too much. It would apply equally to just about every form of adult loving companionship. It's, in other words, I'm basically saying you either take something much more conservative or you go much more liberal than Professor Masih. I just want to make you not a moderate on this issue. And the related point is that internalizing the vision of marriage that he must be presupposing in his argument, if society internalized it because the law taught it, that would not strengthen the stabilizing norms of marriage in our culture. Perhaps it would weaken them. Certainly it would weaken the basis for restoring them. All right, so how does that go? Well, what is the vision of marriage at stake in the proposal to recognize same-sex relationships as marriages? I think it's not something evil, it's not something crazy, it's something quite straightforward. It's the idea that what distinguishes a marriage, what makes it different from other forms of relationship, is that it's a deep emotional bond in the context of commitment, right? It's what you might call a kind of pure companionate vision of marriage. Um, and I think that view cannot explain what makes marriage different from any other form of companionship. It's, it's the permanence, the exclusivity, the monogamy, even the idea that marriage is inherently a sexual relationship, that I think it's very hard for the kinds of arguments that get pushed for same-sex marriage to explain. If marriage is distinguished by a certain kind of deep emotional bond, that's what sets it apart from other forms of caregiving, there is no reason of principle, for example, that it should take a permanent commitment to get off the ground. Right? The, the very deep romantic or emotional bond that's distinguishing it from other forms of love is not itself something that is permanent. There's no reason to think that when that deep emotional or romantic hue goes away, the thing has reverted to a different form of love, that it would be inauthentic to stick with it as a marriage. This is something that Andrew Churlin, a same-sex marriage supporter, um, describes and defines as an expressive individualist conception of what makes a marriage. And he himself says that this kind of soulmate view, which is not specific to same-sex relationships, which some many opposite-sex couples understand themselves to have, cannot explain the norm of permanence. I think the idea that marriage requires an exclusive commitment to get off the ground is harder to explain on this view. If what really makes it a marriage is a certain kind of uh, deep emotional bond or the personal fulfillment of the couple as such, then yeah, for most people by temperament or taste, pledging exclusivity will promote that, but many people report the opposite, that having a by agreement, openly, sexually non-exclusive relationship actually deepens the emotional bond, the romantic commitment that makes it different from other forms of companionship. And I think there's no basis of principle for saying that isn't a marriage. The idea that marriage is inherently a relationship of two people, I think is also going to look arbitrary, discriminatory, just a kind of hang up, um, a kind of arbitrary attachment to tradition. If what really makes a marriage is a certain kind of deep, affective communion. There's no reason in principle that three men, for example, can't have all that, all the companionship that two men can have, cannot throw their lot together, um, be committed to the long, for the long haul, to sharing all the burdens and benefits of common life, want to present themselves to the world as a unit, to be on each other's deeds, to be, uh, to avoid the stigma of being excluded from marriage to avoid stigma for their children as well. So permanence and exclusivity and monogamy, I think even the idea that marriage is inherently a sexual relationship becomes just a matter of overall and for the most part, not a basis of principle. The reason is that on this view, what sex contributes to marriage 
is fostering and expressing a deep emotional bond, is deepening that emotional intimacy that really a matter of degree which distinguishes marriage from other forms of communion on this view. But of course, in that respect, sex is one of a number of activities that promote vulnerability, intimacy, openness, and mutual knowledge. So there's no basis of principle for saying two people who can't be in a sexual relationship legally, who are in a platonic bond to sisters or something like that, couldn't have whatever it is that grounds the public case for recognizing them as a marriage. There'd be all kinds of differences in their relationship, but none, I think, that touch the public case on this view of marriage for legal recognition. This isn't just something that I say. It's not just something conservatives say. It's increasingly something that progressive proponents of same-sex marriage say. So Elizabeth Brake, for example, um, a philosopher, I think, at Calgary, Maybe she's at Arizona State now. She has published an article called Minimal Marriage and expanded it into a book that says, yes, justice requires recognizing same-sex relationships. It also requires recognizing relationships of every size and combination of genders and distribution of duties because there's no place for the state to say that some forms of companionship are more worthy than others. The same argument that tells against the traditional view of marriage with regard to opposite or same sex, tells equally against requiring two-ness or even a presumption of permanence or exclusivity. Two or 300 signatories of something called beyond marriage, many LGBT and allied scholars and activists, including professors here, people who were professors here, uh, Cornell West is one of them, have signed a statement saying, yes, justice requires recognizing same sex, but it also requires recognizing multiple partner, multiple household, deliberately, designedly temporary, sexually open, and even non-sexual relationships, because love and commitment are what is relevant to the civil marriage, and there's no basis for us to say which type of love and which shape or size of commitment. So I'm gonna to return to this point, I'm gonna consider some possible objections to this view, some ways for Professor Macedo to justify the middle ground on it. Um, but first I wanna say something else about the second half of the resolution, which is, well, why think that this wouldn't just strengthen marriage, to include more couples within the current marriage regime? Why isn't that a good thing? Here I wanna start with uh, something that Joseph Raz has written. So he's a legal uh, philosopher at Oxford, no friend of the traditional view of marriage by any means. And he had this to say, one thing can be said with certainty about recent changes in marriage law. They will not be confined to adding new options to the familiar heterosexual monogamous family. They will change the character of that family. If they take root in our culture, then the familiar marriage relationships will disappear. They will not disappear suddenly. They'll be transformed into a somewhat different social form which responds to the fact that it is one of several forms of bonding, that bonding itself is much more easily and commonly dissoluble. All these factors are already working their way into the constitutive conventions that determine what's appropriate and expected within a conventional marriage. What does that mean? It's pretty simple. It's a truism that the law teaches. It shapes culture. And what the law teaches about marriage will, for that reason, over time and in the long run, shape how people expect spouses to act within marriage, how people themselves are disposed to think of what they're getting into and of what it requires of them. And to the extent that people further embrace what has already begun, obviously, which is this kind of pure companionate vision of marriage that says that what makes it distinct from other forms of companionship is a certain kind of deep emotional bond that might go through no fault of anyone. That, which says that it's mainly about a certain kind of personal fulfillment of the participants, which says, among other things, that moms and dads are fully replaceable when it comes to parenting, and in fact, that it's bigotry to think otherwise. The more people internalize those ideas to the extent that marriage law shapes the culture, the harder it will be to live out in practice the stabilizing norms of permanence and exclusivity and monogamy, which start to look again on this view just arbitrary. 
Professor Macedo, interestingly, in the book that he has uh, coming out on the future of marriage, concedes a lot of these points. He concedes that law shapes culture. He concedes that a certain kind of pure companionate view of marriage has already led to a lot of things that he thinks are socially troubling. Uh, the kind of disillusion of all the things that used to be bundled together more strongly in marriage, of sex and family life and commitment and cohabitation and so on. And he concedes that it's to some extent these very developments that make it more plausible to recognize same-sex relationships as marriages. But he doesn't draw what I would say is the final link in the reasoning, which is that embracing the change to include same-sex relationships as marriages would be doubling down on this vision of marriage. And we have the choice not to do that, not simply for its own sake, but as a way of trying to regain a foothold in the culture for rebuilding other aspects of marriage. If you read Slate, The Atlantic, New York Magazine, and so on, and you look up stories of people in poly relationships, in polyamorous relationships, um, you will see a certain theme arising, which is a deep parallel to the same-sex marriage debate. You'll see folks saying, you know, from the beginning of the time when I started having romantic relationships, I realized that there was something different. I wasn't fully satisfied with them in the normal pattern. And then I had a multiple partner relationship and I realized that I had deeper personal fulfillment in those, that I was one of those people, not very socially visible, who found more personal fulfillment in a different kind of bond. You'll see them saying, it is uncomprehending to think that I should just settle for one other partner when multiple partner relationships have a different emotional landscape. They have different ways of overcoming the pettiness and the jealousy of traditional monogamous relationships. Again, we've thrown our lot together. We are committed to each other for the long haul. We don't want to be stigmatized. We don't want our kids stigmatized. And we want social models for other people, other young adults who might find themselves in our situation to know that there's a way forward, to know to, that they don't have to just pass for monogamous. I think, again, Professor Macedo's argument leaves him no answer. Well, he proposes four answers, and I'm just going to end by considering some of those. This is in his book, which he shared with me, um, and then we can talk about them. One is that, well, there's a difference, which is that there is an orientation known as gay or lesbian. There isn't an orientation to polyamory. And I certainly do not deny, I affirm, in case this was part of what you were wondering, that there is a same-sex gay or lesbian orientation. But I don't think that can be the decisive thing. Surely what matters for these purposes is that people have civil access, I mean, on Professor Macedo's view, that people have civil access to the kind of relationship in which they find most personal fulfillment. It doesn't matter, it shouldn't matter, which part of their psychology explains that normatively significant fact about them. If there were a pill to, to be able to change from gay to straight, or if we found a gene that was easily changed at least uh, early on to make people straight, I don't think that would weaken the argument, whatever its merits overall, for recognizing same-sex relationships as marriages. So I don't think the orientation reply will do. He says, well, look, there are huge social costs to polygamy, to, to the phenomenon we see in lots of cultures where a man can have several wives. And that's true. The first thing to note is that that doesn't answer the question about polyamory, which are group bonds, not cases where men, and in particular rich men, get to have multiple wives, but where a group becomes a unit understood as a marriage of whatever gender distribution. The second thing is that this kind of response, well, it just has huge social costs, is unusual in this context and probably wouldn't be accepted for other claims about what the definition of marriage should be because it's unresponsive to the fact that most people think this is a realm of rights. People have a right to recognition of the bond in which they find most personal fulfillment. Again, I think that's the main argument for same-sex marriage. 
If it turned out that there would be huge social benefits to excluding people in a certain socioeconomic bracket, discouraging marriage among them, I don't think anybody would think that was a reason to do so. This is a case where people have an understanding of rights as trumps, to quote Dworkin, trumps on the kinds of social benefits or costs that Professor Macedo cites. You can think about it in terms of, by, by comparison to a realm where we do think that this, the merest social benefit can justify a change in the law, I mean tax policy. Right? We can use tax policy to achieve all kinds of extraneous purposes. We can, if you want to discourage smoking, if you want to encourage education of certain patterns and so on, we can change the tax law to do it. Nobody makes an argument for their favorite tax policy from tax equality. Nobody has the idea that there is some pre-political standard for what the tax rate should be that law should therefore match. But things are different in marriage, and they're different on both sides, again, of the debate. Professor Macedo himself acknowledges this. At one point in his book, he says, you know, some people say, well, we should use marriage law to teach the idea that, uh, that biological connection has special value for people. And Professor Macedo says, you know, I think that's right. David Vellman has convinced me in an article that he wrote that other things being equal, it's better for you to be connected to your own biological heritage. It's a part of your social identity. And then Professor Macedo says, but that has nothing to do with marriage rights matter of justice, matter of access to a basic institution. In other words, he's saying just because it's a social benefit or just because a certain change might produce in this dimension a social cost doesn't mean we can trump a right. He himself recognizes that it's not any kind of consideration that can count, but only ones that go to the basic access to marriage, which I think requires a vision of what makes a marriage. He says, well, multiple partner relationships involve lots of complexity, and there would be administrative costs. This reminds me of the, I think, the worst argument made in favor of DOMA, the Federal Defense of Marriage Act, which said that for federal purposes, marriage is a male-female union. Some people said, including in the litigation, they said, well, you know, if we required the federal government to pay attention to which states had gay marriage and which didn't, that would be an administrative cost. And so there's some administrative benefit. Some bureaucrat will have slightly less work to do if we just have a single standard for federal law. That was laughed out of court, and for good reason. Finally, he says at one point, those who openly engage in plural marriages are fringe characters, and we should hope that they remain such. And I think the kinds of folks that I'm talking about, that I'm citing from these articles, which are also, in some cases, linking to studies that more systematically look at the phenomenon, would say that that's the kind of argument that would have been made 30 or 40 years ago against gay marriage. That this is just a kind of unusual topic and we should keep it at the social margins. I don't think it's an argument that any of us should admit in the debate about what makes a marriage. So I do think, in fact, that the best arguments for recognizing same-sex relationships as marriages would equally favor these other companionate forms. I'm happy to focus, as both of us did to some extent, on the multiple partner case. And I think that the ways of trying to stop that argument are ones that you would never accept, and rightly so, in my mouth for my own view of marriage. Thanks. So now each uh, speaker will have a few minutes to respond to their talks. So uh, Steve, you prove too much. Love's not all you need. You're inconsistent on rights, and you have an unjustified taboo against plural marriage. So I won't try to respond to all of that. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, sit, sit here. I will note one thing, which is that Sharif has uh, studiously avoided actually saying what his argument is as to why, what the principle is that makes marriage two. I'll just, I'll just read a. a two quotations uh, from the book. The dynamism towards the norms of marriage, Tunis, exclusivity, and permanence, come not from the actual or expected presence of children, which some same-sex partners and even cohabiting brothers could have, and some opposite-sex couples lack, but from the way that marriage is sealed or consummated in coitus, which is organic bodily union. And again, another quote, marriage is possible between only two because no act can organically unite three or more or thus seal a comprehensive union of three or more lives, emphasis added. 
Which is to say, if I understand this correctly, that polygamy is impossible because three people can't screw at the same time. <laughs> Which, I mean, uh, that uh, polygamy doesn't, do, again, doesn't work as well as monogamy as a social form, but it's not for that reason. And in fact, if you look at Germaine Grise, his book, which is the magnum opus defending the position that Sharif defends, it's called The Way of the Lord Jesus, uh, when he explains what's wrong with polygamous relationship, he says exactly the same sorts of things that I do. They're prone to conflict. You can't have the kind of reciprocity of rights and obligations between multiple spouses that you're going to have in a two-person reciprocal relationship where each person depends on the other and the other depends on the other one uh, reciprocally and equally. So it's, there are structural d uh, disabilities built into it that are born out in practice. But in any case, I would like Sharif to tell us more about these quotations and again why what's crucial is not children or the need that children, the benefits that children get from stable marriages, but the act that's apt to producing children somehow calls for the norms that children benefit from even in the absence of children. Now I'm not, that, that's as best as I can understand uh, 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 the argument. Let me just say this about the other thing about the position is, the problem is that in the book, like good lawyers, they present the part of their case for marriage as a necessarily heterosexual relationship in the absence of the natural law sexual ethic, the broader sexual ethic, that it actually goes along with. Again, Germaine Grise, in The Way of the Lord Jesus, says marriage is the centerpiece of sexual ethics. So you really can't understand the natural law case for marriage as necessarily a man and a woman without understanding, it seems to me, the wider uh, sexual ethics within which it's embedded. And that's how it was always presented in the past by Grise, by Fennis, and others. And in, in all of those accounts, I'll just mention one feature of them, the sexual ethics. All non-marital sexual acts that are not open to the good of procreation are the moral equivalents of sodomy. Robbie George and, and Jerry Bradley say this in their liberal imagination piece, and Grise says it in the way of Lord Jesus, which is to say, if you're engaging in sexual acts that are not within a permanent marriage and open to the good of new children, that is, if a married couple uses contraceptives, they're engaging in acts that are morally equivalent to sodomy, you know, gays having sex, because they're closing off the good of new life within marriage. They're acting against the good of marriage. Now look, again, there's a, as, there's a, there's a, a, a tradition that goes along with this, and it's a tradition that problematizes sex very intensely, and, and, and prescribes this as a way of integrating our sexual lives with our deeper relationships and so on. It's a strategy for doing that. But there are, and I agree that integrating our sexual lives and our deeper relationships, our commitments and so on, it, it is a challenge for all of us. But that doesn't in any way, it seems to me, prove the, the truth of this particular account. But Sharif has, has, has self-consciously avoided actually articulating his view. Let me just mention two other points about the other things that he mentions. The one thing that bugs me about the book is that whenever the book that he co-authored, What is Marriage, characterizes the people he dis they disagree with, gays trying to marry, they never refer to real cases. They always have a hypothetical. So they say, and again I'm quoting, and he said the same sort of thing here, companionate marriage doesn't make any sense because, you know, it's unstable and so on and so forth. Why would, you know, three, two people, two same gays want to get married? It doesn't make any sense. Why would two gays fall in love with each other, want to spend their lives together? Again, he hasn't explained his own case for it. But there's never any engagement with actual people in making this argument. So they say at a certain point in the book that there's no resemblance between same-sex couples seeking to marry and a married couple, because they say, just deciding to rear a child together is not enough to make you married. Three monks who commit to caring for an orphan do not thereby marry. That's meant to be an analogy. They also say marriage is a, the, uh, uh, why say such a thing? Because marriage is a, their view is that marriage is a special form of friendship that has to be embodied in coitus. Without coitus, shared domestic life, they say, is at best an optional bonus, at worst a suffocating hindrance to non-familial bonds, just as surely as raising a child with your college roommate would be. Again, that's meant to capture the absurdity of same-sex marriage. They don't actually engage with the couples who are seeking to marry. Sandy Steyer, who was married to Chris Perry, was asked, why are you seeking marriage? What's wrong with the domestic partnership that's available to you in California? 
And, so, and her response was, there's certainly nothing about a domestic partnership that indicates the love and commitment that are inherent in marriage. And it's just a legal document. It has nothing to do with marriage, nothing. Marriage, she insisted, means something different in our society. We have a loving, committed relationship. We're not business partners. We're not glorified roommates. We want to be married. It's a different relationship. And I would just suggest that when you read the book in its account of same-sex couples, it's a little bit like a review of I never read of another book ages ago. It's like reading an anthropologist from Mars. There's a kind of cluelessness there and I think a lack of sympathetic engagement with the lives of people uh, whose uh, aspirations uh, you're rejecting and, and regarding as other. And finally, with respect to polyamory, <laughs> he mentions the Elizabeth Brake article in Ethics and, and her book. I've gone through all the footnotes, and I, I've gone through, you know, there's, there's also an article in the Columbia Law Review, Monogamy's Law by Elizabeth Emmons, that also makes an argument for, for polyamory. Everybody cites the same things, citing the same things, citing the same things, and make it seem like there's a lot of cites to things going on. Robbie George has cited the statistic, which came out of Newsweek, that maybe there are 500,000 people living in polyamorous households in the United States. That statistic came, was, was a piece of admitted speculation by a sex therapist from California by the name of Deborah Annapol, who runs this Eastland Institute kind of thing. Her philosophy is called mind pelvic integration. Uh, you know, it's a kind of open marriage, 70s hippie style. You know, they do tantric uh, yoga and so on. Uh, you go to her website, it's called Loving More or something, you know, this is the old idea of open marriages from the 70s. Swingers, you Hefner, this stuff has been, the idea has been around for a long time. It doesn't catch, it doesn't take off. Now all of the examples that Emin cites, she cites a book by Ethan Waters called Urban Tribes and suggests that, oh, these urban tribalists that Ethan Waters talks about in his book, they're harbingers of a new form of family life. Well, Ethan Waters lived in San Francisco in his late 20s and early 30s with some college friends. It was like friends, you know, with, with sex. He slept with her, she slept with him. You know, they became like family. Well, but they, they weren't seeking to get married, they didn't get married, and now Ethan Waters is married, has kids. I mean, it was a stage of life. It was, uh, you know, uh, well off, 20 and 30 something, spending some time together before settling down, frankly. There is no widespread social movement for polyamory in any country in the world. And there has never, in any prosperous society, been a stable social form of plural, uh, egalitarian marriage. There are in some places, like in ethnic regions of Tibet and uh, Southeast uh, Asia, uh, I saw a documentary the other day, two brothers marrying four women. Very poor conditions, and the rationalization given to anthropologists who were studying it was, big families, good labor force. <laughs> They need a lot of people to work a very small spit of land. Uh, and if you split the farm up between the four brothers and the widow, you just wouldn't support anybody. So under desperate conditions, people will come to all sorts of arrangements that uh, uh, are not likely to prosper and be stable under stable conditions. Polyamory is a bugaboo uh, put forward by people on the right uh, uh, to distract us from uh, democratic debate uh, and discussion, in which this is simply not involved. I will simply leave it at that. Good. Well, now the debate is joined. I have, uh, I'm very happy to talk about my view of marriage, which I summarize in the book as comprehensive union. And I think this concept tracks two kinds of traditions which are really uh, related historically. One is the Hebrew Bible tradition of one flesh union. Another is a tradition that goes back, as I said, started to say earlier, to ancient Greek and Roman thinkers. So Masonius Rufus at one point talks about integral amalgamation, which is a clunkier translation, I think, of something like total or all-encompassing union. Uh, Plato has similar sounding things to say in the laws. Plutarch, in a more direct way, in his Life of Salon, uh, and in Eroticos, talks about very similar kinds of considerations that explain in a principled way what makes a marriage. So what's that picture? So, we think that any kind of community is formed by cooperation towards common ends in the context of a commitment. So this academic community is one example. It's formed by cooperation towards which common ends? Well, truth and knowledge and understanding and wisdom, maybe in the best case. So its distinctive form of activity or cooperative activity are the activities oriented towards those ends. Uh, research, lectures, debates, discussions, publication. 
And that distinctive form of cooperation and those distinctive ends also give it its distinctive norms. Norms of academic integrity, of uh, transparency, of publishing all the results even when inconvenient, and so on. And it's in those three respects, unifying activity, unifying ends, unifying commitment, that marriage is integral. That it creates a one flesh or a total union. What do I mean? Well, in the first dimension, in the unifying activity, it unites people not just in heart-mind, but in heart-mind and body. I think that's something people could basically agree to at that level of generality. And that bodily union has something to do with sex. That's, again, I think something that most people on both sides would accept. And here's where people diverge. And our argument is, what makes for bodily union? Why is sex related to that? Well, we say you think about the analogy to a single person. What makes the parts of me, one body, one flesh, is that they're all actively coordinated together towards a single bodily end of the whole. It's broadly speaking, a kind of Aristotelian argument. And that, that single bodily end, in my case, is my biological life. And that radical kind of bodily union is possible between two people, but just in one respect, with respect to reproduction. Only in what our law, as well as religious traditions, have long called the marital act, the thing that distinguishes it as a marriage, are a man and a woman themselves, coordinated together towards a single bodily end of the whole that, that may, they make up together, of the couple as such, um, which is their reproduction. So in the marital act, their union of heart and mind is extended along the bodily dimension. Now, why is that not just a kind of fetishism about biology? Here again, I think there's a deep divergence. If you think the body is a real part of the person, it's not just your instrument, it's not just your property, it's a real part of you, then bodily union creates a distinct and distinctly valuable kind of personal union. So whether you, you know, your views about personal identity might intersect here, might shape whether you think there's distinctive value in being able to extend your union along the bodily dimension in this quite realist way. So it's comprehensive in that dimension. It's comprehensive in the range of goods that unite the couple. Most people understand what, while a university is oriented to knowledge and understanding, a sports team is oriented towards athletic excellence, or whatever it is that sports <laughs> involves, uh, <laughs> The marriage is oriented not just to intellectual goods or recreational goods, but somehow to all of these together. Again, at that level of generality, you'll get agreement. And that fact, I think, is explained by the fact that marriage is inherently oriented, not just to this or that good, but to whole new human beings, new subjects of every kind of good. And what explains that? The point of the examples that Professor Macedo was citing was not to say that uh, you know, gay relationships are like roommates. It's to try to isolate what the principle could be of this connection between a relationship and family life. If the principle was just choice, the choice to make this the kind of community that will rear children, then it wouldn't just be limited to romantic relationships. That's the point of the example. It's an analogy. Analogies are common in law and philosophy all over the place. And we shouldn't just misunderstand what they mean. That was all that was saying. It can't just be choice. What is it? Well, what is it about the form of the relationship itself that makes it related to kids and through that to the whole range of goods and domestic life? We say it's the fact that the very act that makes marital love, the act that embodies it, is also the kind of act that makes new life. So marriage itself, the relationship embodied by that act, is fulfilled by family life, and by the wide range goods that that involves. And if marriage is comprehensive in those two senses, in the dimensions of the partners united, in the range of the goods uniting them, then it calls for a comprehensive commitment. Through time, that means permanence, and at each time, that means exclusivity. You can car caricature this view. You can say it's just the view that you can only screw or you can only screw in a certain way, but two can play at that game. I can say of Professor Macedo's view, or of any view that says that sexual relationships are different in kind, that it just fetishizes orgasm. 
That would be an unfair description of his view, and the idea that m what makes marriage on my view is just screwing is an unfair description of my view. The question is not, can you give an unfair description of the other person's view? Is that, is there an intelligible description of it that makes clear why it's different from other forms of companionship? The idea that this is just some esoteric thing that Robbie and Ryan and I built in a garage somewhere or something and, and then imposed on the world in this silly little book is also deeply historically naive. It's ignoring the fact, again, that there are these deep resonances in, to some extent in Plato and Aristotle, in Xenophanes, Masonius, Rufus, Plutarch, I say this with Alexander Nehemiah sitting right there, uh, Gregory Vlastos, or maybe it was uh, Price, a historian of ancient philosophy, said that to his regret as a social liberal, Plato had basically the same view of sex and marriage as Pope Paul VI. <laughs> that is not because Plato got a letter to his hometown from St. Paul, it's not because he had read Genesis, it's because there was something there to this vision of marriage as a human good. Let me just end by saying that I think Professor Macedo, again, has re returned to the reply to my objections of th th that you would never accept from a conservative. He basically said at the end, there's not enough of them, and they're not loud enough. That's not an argument. So, I'm cognizant of the time that we want to open things to the floor, but if there's any uh, immediate, no, 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 no. Uh, okay. So, uh, there's somebody who's gonna pass a mic around. I mean, I'm very sympathetic to arguments coming from uh, Plato, but uh, at the same time, there's an obvious problem with trying to make an argument from Plato uh, in the present, which is just that Plato was writing before liberalism, essentially. Um, before there was a realization that, uh, as John Rawls puts it, due to the wars of religion and the fact of um, competing salvific ideologies over which people are willing to die, we needed to find first a modus vivendi for living together and second a way of kind of uh, endorsing that uh, normatively. So, so that there the, the, the have to be limits on the kind of coercive power of the state with respect to the good life and on the expressive power of the state with respect to the good life. So that, to take an example which is far less um, controversial, you, okay, yeah, so the university example you gave. The University of North Carolina is in a scandal right now where it seems like, by your definition, it might not even count as a real university. But the idea that the law is just gonna ban that that, that, wouldn't ha that wouldn't be kind of permitted by, um, uh, by the standards of liberalism because the law cannot, I mean, they may have separate legal reasons in that case, but the, the law cannot enjoin a certain vision of the good. That's the basic concept here. And I'm not sure how that really either argument is fully understanding that point. Um, it, would seem, it would seem not to me. So I just wondered what you thought about that. Yeah, so I, I, think, I think there are problems with the political liberalism behind the question, and we could have a debate about that. If I just granted that point, I would say, I think it tells equally against any kind of marriage regime at all. Any kind of marriage law, yes, it creates certain benefits that people on both sides of the debate can be happy with, with that, that can be part of the sort of overlapping consensus. Um, you know, it boosts SAT scores for kids. It, uh, creates, more seriously, it creates certain kinds of stability and economic security and psychological security. That's fine. But it, how does it do that? I mean, Professor Macedo addresses this point. He says, um, you know, therefore, it's okay by political liberalism to have a marriage law in, in response to certain political liberals who say it's not. But the question is, how does it do that? What's the mechanism for those uncontroversially good effects? It's precisely prizing a certain vision of what makes some forms of consensual 
community special. It's some, you know, whatever your marriage law is, it's going to say these are marital and everything else, whatever its moral status, isn't. And I think that is exactly the kind of mechanism that you cannot justify except by appeal to some kind of doctrine, moral doctrine, about what makes some relationships special. Yeah, just an observation and a quotation that I think is relevant to the question. Again, uh, in the book, uh, Georgia Sanderson and George insist, and I quote, that there's a true description of their position that highlights, and I quote, the special value of conjugal acts, and I quote, organic bodily union and life-giving act, both related to the concept of comprehensive union, make the special value of marriage luminous, but apply only to husband and wife and so on. Let me just quote then Paul Griffiths, a Catholic theologian at Duke University, who has advanced what I think is a highly pertinent observation uh, concerning the problems faced by new natural law arguments in a diverse political community. Of the new natural law orthodoxy, he says this, I think the orthodoxy is true. I think the arguments are valid, and it would be better if everyone thought so. But there are not, as a matter of fact, arguments available that do or should convince those who do not hold the orthodox view, whether Catholics or non-Catholics. Doesn't convince them that they should. The lack of such arguments, I'll call them public arguments, is empirically obvious. The premises are rationally disputable. The truth about none of these things is obvious or self-evident which is among the reasons that thoughtful, well-meaning people differ so profoundly about them. And Diff Griffiths goes on to ask the Catholic, uh, as a Catholic addressing the hierarchy, is it part of Catholic orthodoxy to have a particular view about the nature and efficacy of public argument? He says no. So Catholics as citizens should be free to support same-sex marriage as a matter of civil law. This seems to me to display not only, it seems to be good political sense. The premises that underlie the, uh, the natural opposition that, that Sharif uh, discusses are speculative and uh, utterly disputable. Uh, the arguments that support same-sex marriage are commonsensical. Uh, Alec Baldwin has expressed them uh, very uh, eloquently, uh, saying that there are uh, millions of heterosexual couples out there who have no intention of having children together but they want to settle down, to settle down into stable relations, to love one another, and so on. And if they can do that, why can't same-sex couples who want the same things? Thanks. Um, I suppose this question is mostly for Steve, really. Um, I'm a little surprised to what extent you're both sharing common ground in terms of what I see as a rather conservative and perhaps even unrealistic view of marriage. Um, and that is you're, you're emphasizing it as a permanent and exclusive union. Uh, and I think, you know, we all know that I think it's in the United States roughly half of all marriages end in divorce and we don't quite know how many of them are not sexually exclusive but estimates range from 30% to 60%. Um, so I'm wondering really whether you want to say that this is the essence of marriage, that whether this would lead to the implication that divorce ought to be made more difficult to get than it is now and that uh, infidelity ought to be a sufficient ground for regarding the marriage as over. Um, so and, and no, that's, it, that's, that's, that's up to the uh, spouses. Uh, I, I did want to say, and I, 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 I may have been speaking a bit uh, um, uh, in, in uh, formally there, I think marriages set out aspiring uh, to permanence. I think that's generally the expectation. But uh, obviously I think that it can often be the case that uh, spouses decide that it's not working and so on and so forth and especially once children are grown and so on that's perfectly reasonable uh, and can be in everyone's good uh, for there to be uh, a divorce. So all I meant was that I think marriages st start out with an aspiration uh, to permanence. I think they, that, that's typically how, but that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a typical, I don't think that's uh, required. Uh, and then as a matter of, 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 of fact, I mean, uh, the, the, uh, there, are, there are norms, but I, again, I think these th sorts of things, I, I think the, I mean, if I had to pick the core, it would be uh, the commit to, commitment to care for one another, to be there in times of need, and so on, uh, and to uh, share and shape a life together. It's also the case that, uh, uh, you know, there are norms of, uh, of, of exclusivity that for many people, I think, uh, uh, you know, are, are, are public judgments that help to strengthen their commitment. Uh, and, uh, but I don't want to, these aren't matters of, they're not matters of legal requirement. A, a, adultery, uh, like fornication, other kinds of things are not enforced by law anymore. These are more within the realm of the cultural 
uh, sort of understanding of law. So I'm not sure how far I would want to go in those, uh, in, in, in insisting on those as... Uh, 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 Just a clarification, yeah. Steve. So in your view, in principle, does monogamous marriage require sexual exploitation? Uh, well, uh, uh, does it does it require sexual activity? Well, it doesn't. <laughs> or the aspiration toward. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I think this. I think that uh, it seems to be a lot of these matters uh, are um, uh, not settled uh, by um, uh, by abstract principles. I mean, if people want to have an open relationship and they want to agree to an open relationship, they are in fact free to do so. And one would have to see how that works. Oh, well, there, there, are, there are some people that, that do have, uh, that have had. Human beings are so constructed that jealousy is a very uh, powerful force. Uh, uh, that's what tends to undo these arrangements. So I don't uh, think that they work very well, uh, typically. But, you know, there are people that, now, and it's a, it will be, I mean, I, I will, it wouldn't, you know, it, it wouldn't work in my relationship. It, it uh, but uh, uh, the, um, but there are, you know, there, there are qualified. So there, there is some, some claims advanced that same-sex couples are more apt. I mean, this is uh, sort of newspaper reports. What's that? Well, that they're, they're more apt to sort of uh, agree to certain kind of open, you know, to, and Tom, uh, what's the, the Tom Sa Savage, uh, the, uh, the, the sex columnist, Dan Savage, yes, excuse me. Uh, he writes that he, and been, I think his partner been married for a long time, they have children, so, but early on, I think they just, they, they agreed to have two or three uh, threesomes or something. Well, it was very uh, tentative, and uh, and you know they, they seem to have, have sort of. I, I don't want to legislate people's personal uh, uh, you know behavior, uh, and I think we have we do have a li we do have liberal attitudes towards these things, uh, and uh, and you know people cut each other a certain amount of slack. Uh, it, so uh, I'm speaking a bit off the cuff here, but uh, um, I think we I think we want to I think there is a challenge here to balance uh, curbs on you know, outside snoopiness and so on, with certain expectations that married couples do have, uh, you know, reasonable expectations, typically, typically, but people do have unusual marital uh, arrangements, and uh, there are different things that, there is, there is human diversity out there, we have to be careful of that. But these pluralists, by the way, the polygamy, the, the, sorry, the polyandrous, these are typically adult, fluid relationships. It's not clear that these people are seeking marriage. This, they're, they're sexually open, fluid relationships. Uh, there's no great movement for marriage there, and it's not clear that it even counts as a form of marriage. So I, I don't think that, uh, that counts at all. In any case, there's zero systematic studies of polyamory because it's so rare. Uh, as I say, in the, in the, uh, there's not a single systematic study that's cited in any of these works. The Elizabeth Emmons article in Columbia Law Review is 110 pages long, and she has four examples of these couples. One of them, they were in front of the Jerry Springer show, and then there was another one that was involved in a complicated court case. And I mean, there, you know, it's a big world, strange things happen. And, uh, but, but the idea that there's a new marital form out there, a new form of social life that's, that's stable that one can get a grip on is deeply implausible. Can I just say quickly, I, at the beginning of uh, Professor Macedo's response, he, he encapsulated more eloquently and more simply than I did in my opening, what's core to his view of marriage. He said, what is the core is commitment and care. And I'm saying, that's right. On the, on the best articulation of this view of marriage, that is all that's at the core. And that's the reason that any other kind of restriction, including the restriction to two, is arbitrary. Now, if you opened it up and only 1% of the population took you up on the multiple partner relationships, fine. I mean, that it's, it's only going to be 4 to 5%, or maybe at some, by some estimates 6 or 7% that take us up on the um, proposal to have same-sex marriage. But that's not an argument against it. Uh, and I just don't think, and I was going to say that at the beginning, but then Professor Macedo started to contradict himself at the end and said, well, you know, and then there are some changes that, well, if you had those differences, it wouldn't be a marriage anymore, but, you know, there is variety and so on. And I'm all for allowing people to have whatever consensual relationships they want legally. I don't want to legislate in the sense of prohibiting any of those. But it, there is still the question of what we will re and won't recognize as a marriage. Is care and commitment the only principle or not? And I think Professor Macedo, in the span of two minutes, sort of went back and forth three no, 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 or four no, times. No, 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 no. Rom romantic uh, love and commitment is also central to marriage. Brake wants to uh, do one thing, which I think is, uh, many uh, uh, have argued for something like this, that there are forms of caring relationships which are not marital. Uh, 
a, a, an aunt and a, and a nephew uh, who would maybe live together, pool their resources or something, take care, taking responsibilities for one another. And it's quite conceivable that the law could be arranged to facilitate that kind of caring and caregiving relationship. And I think that we ought to, uh, through the law, insofar as we can do that. We already do. We allow people to designate powers of attorney, and we allow certain kinds of joint property and, and surrogate decision-making. We allow some of the incidents of marriage to be peeled off. But those are not marital relationships. Uh, they don't seek to be married. And if you call them marital in the way that Brake wants to do, it would be a positive disincentive, because nobody wants to you know, marry their grandmother. Uh, 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 you, but, but you might want to establish some sort of joint property arrangement, some sort of caring, and, and some other kind of thing. So some of the incidents of marriage ought to be paired off. But, but uh, 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 marriage, as it, and I think you're looking for abstract principles to define the boundaries of a civil institution on the basis of a philosophical abstraction. It seems to me we ought to look at the complexity of people's lives. I mean, if it were the case that there were multi-person romantic relationships that really did, in a stable way, support people's well-being, uh, led to stable and healthy um, personal lives and public lives, well, then uh, we'd have to look into that and, and see uh, how they work and on what basis and so on. Uh, I don't rule these things out a priori, and I don't think that polygamy is wrong in principle. I think it's wrong. I think it's, it, it has bad consequences as a social form. But it's not that the idea of three people settling down together in a family is inherently wrong, you know, or it's wrong by the very nature of things. And it seems to me you're too apt to be looking for arguments that are by the, na by the very nature of their things, intrinsic and inherent. Whereas I want to see how these institutions work as social forms. I'll just say one very quick thing. I know we have to go to Q&A. I think... It's not just me who's demanding a principled basis for this stuff. It's the whole way the discussion has gone in this country, which is understanding this as a matter of basic justice of rights. If you just get cited some contingent social benefit to excluding same-sex relationships from marriages, for example, uh, something that Professor Macedo acknowledges as valuable, which is the I spreading the idea that there's special connection to, um, between parenting and biology, that, biological parenting, other things equal is better. People would say, well, that's not enough to trump a right. And I don't think that these other contingent considerations will do against polyamory. Hi there. Um, so my question is actually quite self-centered. Um, I'm wondering how my parents' relationship, um, which has been committed for 23 years, and uh, what, from the outset, having children, creating life, and fostering it, I'm the result, uh, has, that's been clear from the outset. How does the fact that one person's organs is not inserted in another person's make their relationship not a marriage? So I missed the beginning part of the question, but I, I got the end part. <laughs> okay, and so the premise is that I have two lesbian mothers. I, okay, so I think we can ask it just as a matter of people's organs. And if either the body weren't really a part of the person, or if it were simply a matter of Euclidean geometry, the pieces fit, they don't fit together, your question would have full force. But if there is something special about some kind of bodily union, and I think the best evidence that people on both sides think that's true is that they think sex is special in this context. My claim is that this view of marriage, the conjugal view, has the best explanation of that fact. If what made sex special was that it expressed and fostered affection, then it would be important but not unique. Then we could just ask the same question you asked someone else who you know, has a relationship that's non-sexual but deep and platonic and involves vulnerability and mutual expo exposure and um, you know, facing life's troubles together, could ask of you, well, why is the fact that our relationship doesn't involve the firing of certain neurons that's associated with sexual climax, why does that make it less valuable? And that goes back to the general point that there are different ways of understanding these distinctions. And the question is, is there an, intel is there an accurate description that makes intelligible the difference. And I think comprehensive union, real bodily union, uh, understood as more than fostering affection does. Can I just compare this, this, the parent, these parents with a heterosexual couple who has the equipment and so on, but decides that their marriage is not about having children. They use contraception regularly. 
So they could have children, but they decide not to. Now, why is it that they're included in marriage, but here, they're, they're not? It may be that because her parents have, have had children, that, that, that their, their marriage looks to me like, if you're going to take that as crucial, that it's more oriented to long-term and permanence than a heterosexual couple, perhaps, who, who choose against the, the good of new life and so on. Why, why, is, that, why is it crucial? They restrict I, their fertility for the sake of philosophical yeah. Uh, knowledge. Yeah. Do they uh, constitute a marriage? Well, no, I think if they do from the get-go and for the long haul, they're not. Now, here are two things to say about that. One is, there will always be privacy-based reasons that whatever your view of marriage is, it won't strictly track the legal reality. If you think what makes it a marriage is that this is your number one bond, you might still be opposed to administering a test that says, how closely would you rate your affection for your... Uh, partner, right? So there are invasions of privacy that can give us reasons to not ask questions that then create some disconnect between your vision of marriage and what the law is. The second thing is that sounds, what I just said about the heterosexual couple or indeed about your parents, sounds shocking and offensive to some extent depending on what vision of marriage you already have. If you think of marriage as distinguished mainly by degree as your number one affective communion, then yes, you will hear what I said as saying that marriage is less. But if you don't, if you have a different and more specific view of marriage as oriented to one kind of communion, but one among several different basic forms, then you will be a little bit more liberated in this respect to understand that not having a marriage doesn't mean what you have is less, it means that what you have is distinct. And there can be deep forms of affective communion and love that involve great moral virtue and growth that aren't a marriage. That's something that my view of marriage makes possible and that the alternative doesn't. But you did say that the heterosexual couple that uses contraceptives and so on doesn't have children is not a marriage. Oh yeah, if they say, if they say so from the get-go, that's fine. Now here, you know, there are going to be, Peter Singer nope. can tell you that there, whatever vision of important and disputed policy and philosophy questions you have, if you push all the way to consistency, will create surprising results. Mm -hmm. Peter Singer and Robbie George on the other side on this campus illustrate that on the issue of life. I think I'm illustrating it on the issue of marriage, and I'm saying that Professor Macedo's view, taken to a more consistent place, would do the same in the opposite direction. That is not a surprising result. That is a fully expectable one in this realm. Um. So it seems like you're very interested in defining marriage. Why do you care whether or not gay people can get married? It seems like you care a lot about making this distinction of a definition, but why does it matter to you whether or not my mom can say, oh, this is my wife or this is my partner? Start passing the microphone. I, well, so I think, again, what makes the difference here is that the law teaches, and what it teaches will shape people's behavior and expectations and understandings, and that shapes what happens. So to the extent that we double down as a culture and further internalize the pure companionate view of marriage, which can't make sense of these stabilizing norms in a systematic way, to that extent I think they will be eroded over time. The same thing happened with no-fault divorce. People said, it's a win-win. If you're in a high-conflict marriage, it just makes it easier to get out. If you're in a low-conflict marriage, what do you care? How will it affect you or your marriage? And 20 and 30 years down the line, people on both sides of the political aisle in sociology are saying, actually, it's a little different. It made people more likely, it made people keep their eye on the exit ramp more, which made them more likely to take it than they would have otherwise been. That's the way that law shapes culture. Okay, uh, Shri, just a point of clarification, I think it's an important question. Do you think the state should not recognize heterosexual marriages that restrict their fertility? Well, I, the point of my privacy thing is I was saying, I think that's the kind of thing, asking people about what, they're gonna, what their parenting plans are is the kind of invasion of privacy that asking, on the revisionist view of marriage, asking the couple, well, rate your degree of affection for your partner would be on that right. view. So you view it as not a marriage, but the state should, for various reasons, recognize it as such. Yeah, for prudential privacy. For privacy. For privacy. Okay. Yes, there's a question there, and then we're going to come over here. Thank you. Um, a, a few questions for uh, Professor Macedo, more on the issue of poly. Um, yeah, it seems to me that you are applying a different rubric to same-sex monogamous couples as you are to poly, or to poly arrangements. 
which is for same sex, you're saying, well, okay, let's look at what's there. Let's look at the actually existing relationships in the US. Um, and for poly, or what you mostly call polygamy, you say, well, there's these polygamous uh, sort of arrangements and they end up being pa uh, very patriarchal. Um, and it doesn't seem that you're really looking at what is, ex what is actually currently happening in our society. So I'm wondering why that is. Um, and I would ask you also to clarify your position on, um, I would say poly versus, or pol polygamy or word, however you put it, and um, money. Because on the one hand you're saying, uh, you mentioned that, well, it would be, would be bad if you had polygamy because it would be for rich people to conglomerate their wealth. And then later on you also, you also um, cited the example of the family structure in Tibet. Um, and so that, that's also illegitimate. Uh, and we know all that is actually people with limited resources pooling their resources. So it seems like you're objecting to the rich, uh, sort of th this idea of, you know, polygamy would be for the rich and they would, uh, this would be, you know, incentivize um, greater wealth div division. And then on the other hand, but it, it's also bad for people with more limited resources to be able um, to form their own structures around that. So I'd ask you to clarify that. Sorry, and I wasn't sure I, I heard all of that, but I, I think what you said is um, uh, my argument against uh, institutionalized and recognized polygamy, because I'm not talking about the application of the criminal law, I'm talking about what we recognize as marriage, uh, is based on optimality, and, but maybe there are other things that aren't optimal that we're also perhaps allowing in. But let me put it this way. I, I, what I'm trying to do is code as a fundamental right everyone's right to settle down in a recognizable marital relationship, the way that marriage is defined now in the United States, uh, uh, with, with one other person. Uh, and that there are, are reasons for that having to do with, first of all, that's the fundamental opportunity that we can secure for everyone that is, that is widely understood to be crucial to people's well-being and basic good. Um, what we know about plural uh, marriages uh, uh, are, are highly problematic. That doesn't mean we're going to criminalize them. I mean, it's a free country. People are free to uh, live under these arrangements. The fact is, uh, uh, in Utah and elsewhere, it's really been the case that polygamy is not criminalized. What's criminalized is seeking a second legal marriage license. And there's been some ambiguity about what counts as violating the law in Utah. But in any case, that, that law has just been uh, clarified and struck down. So, um, so, so people are, are, are free, to, free to do these things. But as I say, yes, I, I do worry that uh, when we look around and see what polygamous marriages look like, especially uh, uh, in, in, uh, uh, as they've existed in, in North America, they're, they are highly uh, uh, problematic. So um, at least I don't think there's a, a clear reason for recognizing them as marriages, because it's not clear that they serve people's fundamental interests in the same way. It's not clear that it makes sense to regard them as, a, as part of fundamental liberty, which we want to define equally for everybody. Uh, and it's also not clear that they serve the, the sort of general purposes that make it rash, reasonable for a government to recognize and give certain kinds of support to marriage. All kinds of things would have to change. I mean, we'd have to, we'd have to change the legal incidence of marriage quite considerably if multiple people were entering into it, because they've all been designed for, uh, for monogamy. But I, 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 I am a liberal when it comes to liberty questions, and uh, I'm prepared to allow people to sort of do their own thing. And, and, and lead their own lives. All I was saying was that, and I, I do tend to have a bias towards systematic evidence, in part because I see marriage as a social institution that has a similar form across the country that while we live in a very diverse country, it's actually an astonishing thing about marriage that it's an off-the-shelf arrangement that people can adapt in various ways through a certain range of prenuptial agreements. They could also bypass marriage and simply settle down and enter into a series of contracts, but it provides an off-the-shelf uh, package complex package of legal entitlements and responsibilities, which people have found useful in certain kinds of relationships. It's not at all clear that they'll work in other kinds of relationships, including poly relationships. So I just don't, I, I, I don't know of any systematic evidence to suggest in the United States or any Western European country that there's an emergent social form uh, of a poly sort, which is why we don't observe in democracy social movements that are equivalent to the decades-long movement for same-sex rights. But it's a free country. When such a thing emerges, well, then we'll take a look at it and, and consider it in democratic politics. But I'm, I'm trying to address these issues as issues of, 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 of democracy. So uh, there's a question. Yes, the gentleman there. My question is for Professor Macedo. Why legislate a term? People can call their relationships what they want in the status quo. Yeah. Under a liberal view, the state should be neutral. 
couple of what I didn't hear the end of that. Under a liberal view, the state should be neutral. Yeah, no. Can well, you pass the microphone and the person, you can bring the microphone, I want to move over here. I know there's a couple of questions here and, and we're going to end state, fairly soon. Yeah. So I think neutrality tends to be exaggerated as a requirement to political institutions. It's taken out of a core uh, area of application where it makes sense. We should be neutral about religious beliefs and so on because they're highly contentious. We shouldn't be neutral about health. We shouldn't be neutral about happiness. We shouldn't be neutral about prosperity. We shouldn't be neutral about athletic excellence. We shouldn't be neutral about artistic excellence and so on and so forth. And the defenders of neutrality, like Dworkin, uh, actually uh, uh, does, is not himself neutral. He thinks that the government should support a rich framework of deep and valuable options within which people choose. Actually, when Dworkin got around to discussing marriage in uh, Is a Democracy Possible Around Here book, he says of marriage, he completely throws neutrality out the window. He says of marriage that it's a uniquely uh, important and, and institution. He said something about marriage that you could no more reinvent marriage than you could reinvent love. Uh, and he has no problem at all with it being recognized uh, in the law because uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't elaborate on it. But ne neutrality, I think, is a, um, it's a, it's a label that's applied to a variety of strategies for being fair. And uh, in fact, there are a multiplicity of ways of being fair to people. I would say that the way we be fair to people with respect to various kinds of relationships is we should be supporting marriage, but also other things too, other relationships that prove themselves to secure equal liberty and in people's interests. So these other kinds of caring and caregiving relationships that are not marital, sure, if we can recognize them and support them and so on, then we should do so. Uh, so we, but, but that doesn't preclude us from supporting marriage. Uh, and, um, and, and in fact, our government is not, as a general matter, neutral. Uh, we, there are various sorts of broad-based public goods that our government does support within frameworks of equal liberty. I saw a number of I like all of that on this row here. So first, the gentleman in the back. And, and then we're gonna to move to you. So you said um, one of your reasons for not liking polyamorous relationships was that um, they tend to be problematic. You kind uh, of- Polyamorous or polygamous? Polygamous, let's okay. say polygamous. Um, so, yeah. I mean, I'm pretty sure everyone here would agree that if I said um, gay relationships tend to be problematic, or even for that case, heterosexual couples tend to be problematic, which Dr. Singer, pointed out that, you know, what is it, 50% and the divorce, um, that shouldn't be exactly a reason um, for why I shouldn't be for um, polygamous relationships. I was kind of wondering, you also said um, at this moment, you know, not a lot of people are pushing for polygamous relationships, therefore, um, let's evaluate it when it comes up. Well, I think the point of uh, what he's trying to present is that at what point are you going to have an argument to even go against polygamous relationships? Yes. You know, what, what is the limit? You know, yeah. what, well, I think we okay. define the limits on a case-by-case -case basis. I don't think we look for one very abstract principle, which in Sharif's case, I have to say, has no grip on our society because it's not how we think about marriage here. It's, it's marriage defined for some other society. We have already had the companionate conception of marriage for many decades. Uh, and uh, it is the way that marriage is understood here. So we just have to accept that. And then when it comes to these other things, the other positions on the slippery slope need to be taken individually. Incest, I mean, I have a very short discussion of incest because, I mean, obviously, allowing uh, siblings or parents and children to have sexual relationships threatens the uh, security of the family as, a, as an institution that's dedicated to nurturing children in a trustful environment for the future, and that would be threatened by uh, allowing, you know, if it happens when people are, but we, do, we certainly have no reason, we have re ample reasons to be concerned about uh, ancestral, ancestral relationships for all sorts of obvious reasons. And I would just say, suggest the evidence with respect to polygamy and the account of polygamy is systematic and serious. And the other thing, as I said, was the uh, uh, monogamy, or at least as a matter of legal recognition and uh, admission to these benefits and so on, can be secured for everybody. There's, there's no evidence there's a matter of social practice that monogamy can be secured for everybody. Uh, Sharif, do you admit that American conceptions of marriage have already gone the way of companionate marriage? Yes, to a, to a very significant extent. I agree it's for several decades, and I would point to the same social changes um, to pick them out. I would say that in the Tunis, in the presumption of sexual union, in the opposite sex um, criterion, and many other ways, uh, in a lot of the incidents of marriage that are shaped to family life in, in a particular way, we still have some of the other conception. 
And the question is just going to be, which direction do we go? Do we double down on the compa pure companionate view, um, which partly requires thinking about the effects of it so far, or do we stop the trend towards it to regain a foothold, to be able to rebuild other stabilizing norms that Professor Macedo and I agree have deteriorated with the advance of the pure companionate view? And the companion view, on your, your view, is not just wrong, but actually harms the view you hold about one man and one woman. Yeah, it's not, it's not that it's wrong to have companionship. It's great to have companionship. It's that it's a misunderstanding of what makes marriage distinct, and that erasing the distinction between marriage and companionship generally is itself what has the harms. Okay. Yes. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Kristen Beach. I'm a PhD candidate in demography. I study sex, marriage, and fertility. Uh, not the ethics or the laws, but what's actually going on. And um, I have to tell you that the three things are very much studied separately because there is a very large disjoint in the United States and abroad between reproduction and marriage. Half the births in the United States occur to non-married women. So my question is to you, and I guess giving you an example, I don't understand why me and uh, my female partner should have less rights, civil, civil rights, when we make the same kind of decisions in terms of economics and raising a family as a man and his female partner. Thank you. Well, so I think there are, it sounds like part of what you're saying is, look, if we have thrown our lot together, if we share a home and we're committed to doing so for the long haul and we have deep, uh, relationship of communion, care, and affection. There's no reason in principle to deny us a lot of the things that would facilitate exactly that. There are certain needs that arise from sharing a home for life, and they need to be met in certain legal ways. If that's the argument, I think I can go with you a long way down that road, and I just would say what it would result in is not a new definition of marriage. It would result in a different set of legal incidents, and here I think Professor Macedo and I to some extent agree. There may be practical needs that arise wherever you share a home for life that should be met wherever you share a home for life, whether it's a sexual relationship or not, whether it's gay or straight or something else, whether it's two or three. Uh, yes, in the far back, and maybe we'll have one or two more questions depending on so this is for Sharif in response to what you just said. Do you believe that there are any laws that should apply only to married couples as opposed to couples that share a home, for instance? Sorry, can you say, can any you repeat that? Any laws that should apply to married couples alone as opposed to companionate? Sure, well, I think, the, I think there are lots of legal incidents that are meant to encourage child rearing. And I think that those in particular are something that, because I think I agree with Professor Macedo that the biological connection makes a difference, that, that, and I disagree with Professor Macedo maybe, that having a mother and a father overall and in the long run make a difference. I think that we should arrange these legal incidents in a way that privileges marriage with respect to child rearing. Why are we required to change our public understanding of marriage to suit your understanding? which very few people in our society accept. The vast majority of married couples use contraceptives virtually all the time. I remember talking to a married couple, I know about the, the husband about this, and said, you know, they have this, the view about the coitus sealing the relationship, and so on. He said, but geez, when we were trying to have kids, that was like the hardest time. You, know, you had to be careful with timing it, and so on and so forth. That's like, that was like the, the least, you know, uh, kind of <laughs> marital sex we had in some way. He's sort of suggesting somewhat facetiously, but, but this is, a, this, is a, this is a foreign view to what marriage is now in the United States, whereas given the view of marriage we have now in the United States, especially generationally, I mean, if you look at people over the age of 60, 70, and so on, of course, they grew up in a time in which there was no understanding of homosexuality as we exist it now. It was thought to be a lifestyle choice. Uh, the majority only started understanding that people are oriented uh, by na nature a deep-seated uh, said to, to, to be in the 80s, 90s, basically. Prior to that, it was a psychological disorder and it was seen as some sort of perverse uh, lifestyle choice, like you know, sailors on a submarine or something. You know, people are just desperate and they'll do all sorts of things. So, so the older generations were shaped by you know, incredible witch hunts against gays in the McCarthy period, uh, 
civil service rules in the 1960s that automatically would dismiss people for being gay and so on. And among younger generations, including among the most religious, uh, the vast majority uh, have accepted uh, 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 as legitimate same-sex marriage and same-sex relationships. So what you're, you're calling for is a fundamental revision to our civil understanding of marriage, which answers to our civil purposes, for the sake of what looks to me like a sectarian view. It's a sectarian view. The idea of male-female marriage, the idea of conjugal union being integral it, to it, the idea of total commitment being integral to it, that's sectarian in the sense that it's shared by countless cultures, by figures that are within and outside the religious tradition. Yes, Augustine and Aquinas, but also in some ways Plato, and in some ways Kant, in some ways Gandhi. How many American yes. citizens? Hold on. <laughs> the second thing is... We live under our own constitution, not the constitution of Aquinas. That's right, but the, the, the constitution, constitution doesn't... Supreme law. The constitution doesn't not say... The law. The constitution doesn't say marriage is inherently a male-female relationship. The Constitution doesn't say marriage is two. The Constitution doesn't say, uh, it doesn't favor your view of marriage or mine. Now, here's, the answer to your question is, your question was, well, why, now that we've gone this far down this road, why not continue down it? And I would say, I would point to the kinds of social changes, the kinds of harms, unintended harms, that have come with undermining the distinction between marriage and companionship as we have over the last several decades. And there are harms that you point to in your book that you identify as harms, the decoupling okay, of pr parenting and commitment and children and sex and, co and all the rest of it. I would say those are bad things. There's a reason, public policy-based reason, not for discouraging every form of companionship that isn't a marriage on my view, but for sharpening the distinction in the public mind between marriage and these other forms. Let me just make one observation about this, which is that we observe, and Sarah McClanahan's work and others here is very good on this, very different marriage patterns across different demographic groups in our country. Among the college-educated, both spouses college-educated, the typical pattern is, People have sex, people use contraception, they have premarital sex and so on. They delay getting married at, until, uh, until they're in their late 20s, early 30s. They delay having children until after they're married. And those married, they have liberal attitudes towards contraception, they have liberal attitudes towards abortion, they have liberal attitudes towards gay marriage. They're doing all the things wrong, I think, in your view. Those marriages are extremely stable. The divorce rates in those marriages are back where they were in the early to mid 60s. And they, those kid people are engaging in hyper-good parenting. Uh, they, they nurture their kids. And of course, they're also egalitarian marriages. The women have careers. There's, there's more equal sharing and housework and so on. They're the kinds of marriages we want to promote. On the other hand, among those who have only high school degrees, uh, and as long as it's economic, or high school dropouts, they're, they're, they have much more traditional views towards gender roles in marriage. They think the husband should be the brand. I'm, I'm generalizing here, obviously. Uh, they often, they, they don't use contraception as much. They, they tend to get married younger, they, but they also tend to simply have babies much younger. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, a lot of it's economics, and they sort of drift into parenthood without, uh, without adequate planning. That should be just, but those are not, well, that, that's exactly, we want to address and improve the situation of marriage by, I agree with Isabel Sawhill, who has a book just out called Generation Unbound, making, uh, effective birth control more available so people can plan their pregnancies and decide deliberately when they want to have their pregnancies. The large majority of pregnancies now are unplanned or not fully planned, and it's because uh, people are using ineffective forms of contraceptives. Uh, condoms only work 80% of the time. Uh, uh, so I, I, we should, tomorrow night, should, contraception a debate will be happening in Makash 10, um, but I promise this one very quick question, because uh, you know, Sharif doesn't want us to be moderate, but I'm going to have to moderate and say that we're going to end in about three or four minutes here. So just very quickly, if you could. Uh, so very quickly, I, I, I want to understand uh, if there's a possibility to move away from this companion view of marriage while at the same time maintaining the gains of the sexual revolution. Because I, I, I don't... I, 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 well, at the same time, what? Sorry. Uh, maintaining, the gains. maintaining the gains of the sexual revolution. Yeah, so let me say something about that and then something about Steve's last point. Um, look, the, the sexual revolution had important benefits. It had the benefits of uh, equalizing the genders. It had the benefits of 
freeing people from the idea that there was a very particular and in, and in particular asymmetric um, role for men to play and for women to play. I don't think there's any reason that thinking that permanence and exclusivity and conjugal union and family life, and thinking that overall and in the long run, without forcing anybody to do anything, men and women tend to have different parenting arrangements. All of those considerations, I don't think we have to give up on the equality and the equal dignity of men and women to realize. Um, on Professor Macedo's last point, I would encourage you to look at Brad Wilcox's coverage of this. This is the Red State, Blue State uh, book and I think associated study that we're looking at these trends. And the picture when you dig down even just a little bit is quite a bit more complicated. One thing that the, they show is that, you know, on the surface the argument was there's way less teenage childbirth in Maryland than there is in Kentucky, and yet Kentucky has the conservative social views. Well, in fact, there's the same rate in that connection in particular, there's the same rate of teen pregnancy, and 60% less teen birth in Maryland because of abortion. So partly it is because of the differences on a different issue. There, when you dig down, there are two other uh, factors. One is that this is strongly correlated with economic status, which we already knew that economically difficult situations make it harder on a marriage. And that when you splice the distinctions, people who did have most conservative uh, social views of these issues as measured by, for example, weekly attendance at a conservative house of worship, and had, because of that, a community that supported the more demanding or conservative norms, actually had the most stable marriages, as compared to secular um, folks who, just along that dimension, had the least. So, so I think, you know, you can always find cases where, at the surface, you can pitch things in a certain way, um, but looking just beneath it, in this case, complicates that. So there are many issues still on the table. We haven't talked much about, for example, accommodation for religious groups with respect to these legal changes, and even new cases where Reformed Jews or the United Church of Christ has, for religious reasons, wanted same-sex marriage. And I'd, I'd be, in a closing remark, if Sharif, you would like to address that question, and or any, you don't have to, uh, maybe brief if you have any couple of sentences, and then we'll call it quits. On religious... What your view of the religious accommodation question is. Yeah, I think, uh, <laughs> I think it's critical, and this is actually something that can and should be common ground to people on both sides of the marriage debate. Whatever you think makes a marriage, makes it distinct, uh, what its eligibility requirements should be, you should enforce third, private third parties, uh, whether by you know, criminal law certainly, but also in more subtle ways, by conditions on federal contracting, by uh, conditions on getting a license to have an adoption agency and so on, should enforce thir private third parties to get into line and affirm the public view of these things. Uh, I think basically the RIFRA standard, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which says that uh, in order to be able to, to be justified legally in coercing people uh, against their moral or religious objections, you have to have a compelling state interest achieved by narrowly tailored means. I think that's a pretty good standard in general. It won't mean that the religious group always wins, but it means that the burden is on the government to show that it shouldn't. Closing thoughts? Well, I, I, I don't think any religious uh, uh, person should be required to perform a same-sex marriage, uh, and I think that uh, religious and uh, ethical ideals that only some within our community uh, accept uh, and which they're unable to persuade the rest of us uh, to value ought to be uh, confined to their religious communities. They are, you're welcome to define marriage your own way in your own religious community and to regard civil marriage as something else, put parentheses around it or whatever. But, but it seems to me that uh, uh, we've not heard a good case for redefining uh, the civil uh, uh, institution of marriage as it's, uh, as it's uh, we've been arrived at it in this country over the last few decades. Let's thank our speakers for a very spirited uh, debate.